Yeah, next we have Sarah Frankie Summers. Sarah Frankie Summers is a third year PhD studies student in the religion and society program in the religious studies department at the University of Texas at Austin. She is interested in the relationships between music, community, and identity and how commitments to anti-oppression manifests in the three. Thank you, Pal. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, Okay. The text with this first image reads, we need not think alike to love alike, designed by Casey or Kit Lynn. The primary image is of two interlocking circles, the space between which is colored with segments of the rainbow from red to black. Inside the circles is a black chalice with a thinly drawn stem and a flame of red, orange, and yellow resting above it. Going, um, I'm going to start us off with a, a linguistic analysis of a song written by a Unitarian Universalist minister in 2007, supplemented by data gathered from my field notes at this minister's congregation in the past two and a half years. I chose this song for several reasons, uh, three of which I will name now and another later in the presentation. First, is it, it is a useful entry point for sharing some interesting aspects of a curiously nonconformist religion with you. Secondly, for a chance to dip my toe into the field of sensual scholarship on religion. And thirdly, of course, to explore some of the themes of this conference, namely queer desire, isolation, and destabilization. I was initially reluctant to appropriate the reclaimed and expansive use of queer out of respect to the individuals and communities who toil to liberate the word and seek to construct it as a framework which intentionally eludes definition. Yet based on my data, I found it a mutually uplifting term in the context of the Unitarian Universalist religion, which I will discuss today. And I'm grateful for any feedback on any aspect of this preliminary work. Uh, a quick little background on the singer. Um, she has three full-length albums and is featured on her wife's album as well. She also has published eight books. Without further ado, uh, Mang uh, the song is called Mango Thoughts. Um, can you see the, the other window that's open or just the PowerPoint still? Just the PowerPoint. Super. Well, I am so glad I found you. I was out here on my own. Couldn't find a single place where I could feel at home. I was just amazed to see that you'd been here so long. Grateful that you persevered. I wrote you all this song. I was thinking mango thoughts in a meatloaf town. The food for thought was all the same. It really brought me down. Nothing on the heavenly buffet line was satisfying. My appetite for truth and right and sitting here just sighing. Everybody else seemed fine with blue jello, green peas, banana pudding, nothing spicy, no blitzes, no Vietnamese. I was craving jalapeno talk just to soothe my soul, saying unsurprising things, taking all my self-control. I am glad the talk is straight here. I know a lot of the people are not. We got patriots and protesters. That ain't all we got. Atheists and redneck Hindu. We got pagan Buddhist Jews. Some of us like the Christian songs. Some just believe the blues. Mango 
up starts with an acoustic guitar and solo female voice. Folk style drums and bass, bass guitar join in, and the song moves along in a 4-4 time until the ending music is completed. Which is where it kind of goes into a time change with the ending. The song opens with an expression of gratitude for a religious community that ended the songwriter's spiritual isolation. She likens the community to a physical place, a home, yet these references are metaphorical in the sense that the community is embodied in the individuals that comprise it, not necessarily the building in which they gather. We could also look more deeply into what it feels like in our bodies to feel at home. I invite you to take a moment to drop into your bodies as you are willing and able and recall feeling at home. Where do we feel this? With what sense are we perceiving it? The song also references the historical significance of the community both in Austin, Texas since the late 1800s and its roots in Boston, Massachusetts in the early 1700s. This theme of seeking community, specifically moral community, evokes Emile Durkheim's interpretation of religion, which is most applicable, mostly applicable to the Unitarian Universalist religion, although expounding on where it falls short will be part of my work in the next couple of years. The mango thoughts are set in opposition to the dominant environment of meatloaf, of a meatloaf town, evoking its queer potential. Fruit, fruity, sweet, tropical, potentially even exotic, particularly when opposed to heavy, stereotypically American family-oriented meatloaf meal. Juicy mangoes are also a multi-sensory experience, the flavor that lights up the tongue, the scent wafting into the nose that penetrates the body even before the tongue touches the juice, the juice that runs down the chin and sticks to the hands, leaving behind the sense of a pure pleasure having been enjoyed with the whole self. Not that there's anything wrong with meatloaf. I love my family recipe and its smells evoke nostalgia and warmth and comfort, but it sure isn't a mango. Food as metaphor, uh, in this case, metaphor for information. Um, food as metaphor has been used by other scholars um, for, like Elizabeth Perez in Religion in the Kitchen. Um, to, uh, to, to guide analysis. And so I'm moving forward along these lines. Um, our songwriter was seeking something to chew on, something new and different. And she notes the lack of anything to satisfy her queer desire. In the second verse here, the song makes explicit its reference to religious seeking. The heavenly buffet is the breadth of known religious and spiritual traditions within which the songwriter has been searching with a hunger. That she is searching for truth indicates some expression of belief that the alleged truths to which she has had access thus far are not true for her. That religious canon, so to speak, is the normative framework from which she seeks to deviate. Perhaps she seeks a queer truth. That she is also looking for might reveals that she is seeking a truth which itself reflects strength and resilience, but also which is willing to harness that strength. Her muscles ache for action like the vase cries for water. A sigh is a whole body experience. Try it. Everybody take a deep breath in and sigh. The back, chest, abdomen, shoulders, neck, head, all participate in the sigh, seeking to release the tension of hunger, of longing. Continues as a metaphor for information, here classifying some foods as paradigmatic of the normative expectations around religious expression. Everybody else is willing to swallow the religious teachings, which the songwriter paints almost as childish. Blue jello, green peas, banana pudding, and nothing spicy are all safe, kid-friendly foods. The uncritical or unexamined diet is easy to swallow. But the songwriter doesn't want something that is easy to swallow. She wants something to challenge her, to surprise her, and therefore to comfort her. She is tired of conforming to expectations. I think the Blintzes and Vietnamese line refers to the Eastern European and South Asian communities in Austin, where one can find restaurants, grocers, and markets. Thus, in this line, she is foreshadowing her relocation to Austin, where she can access new sensory experiences, not only through culinary diversity, but also through that spicy talk, that queer talk, that pushes just enough out of the normative blandness and envisions something new. In this portion of the song, the songwriter describes some of the diversity of her newfound religious community and playfully posits her gratitude for the straight talk in tandem with her gratitude for her fellow queer community. The political diversity stands out as surprising and then it is quickly followed by an even more surprising if not unbelievable smattering of religious identities and affiliations which she suggests are all a part of this religious community. 
This is in some ways one of the most potent representations of the Unitarian Universalist religion, where atheists, redneck Hindus, and pagan Buddhist Jews can all worship together because it is not belief or doctrinal adherence that binds them together as a community. It is the deviance from normative religious expectations and subversion of some religious conventions. They still meet on Sunday mornings. They still incorporate music and other nominally traditional aspects of worship into their rituals. Yet the rejection of a need for a unifying dogma or sameness and the willingness to embrace and encourage spiritual diversity or even religious pluralism is part of what satisfies the queer desire that has been so palpable for the songwriter. Additionally, oh, sorry, still back here. Uh, additionally, the music itself is called to the foreground with a recognition that even those who have converted out of Christianity may still find comfort and nostalgia in those hymns and the suggestion that the blues are themselves a religion or creed in which one can place belief and organize a cohesive spiritual practice. There is a whole field of texts that explore the relationships between jazz and religion, such as Religion Around Billie Holiday by Tracy Fessenden and the Lift Every Voice and Sing by Vaughn A. Booker, to name just a few. This is where the clip I played at the beginning ended. So we haven't heard this last part. Um, how am I doing on time, pal? You're at 10 minutes. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to play this, but I will put the link to the song in the chat at the end, um, and you're welcome to, uh, to visit that um, later if you like. So again, here there's the recollection of the unmet queer desire and relief for the end of isolation, the surrounding by community. The haptic sense emerges in this verse and reveals that it has been there all along as well. There are a few different conceptualizations of the haptic, for example, Pablo Moret considers the reciprocity of touch as an essential aspect of the haptic sense, for all touch is also to be touched, and one can be touched both physically and metaphysically. Another understanding of the haptic associates it more explicitly with movement, the kinesthetic sense of moving and moving into touch. The songwriter expounds on this abundance of community with the sensual diversity of foods, tastes, ideas, and satisfaction only a feast could offer. Together, the spirits and minds the whole selves of the individuals can relish and delight in the feasts which go even beyond mango thoughts. She articulates some of the community's unifying values, honest communication, loving action, and kindness throughout, while evoking additional senses of hearing and movement. The first four lines of this are spoken, um, so they stand out, um, and then she sings again the last verse. The sensuous indulgence, the, ab the abundance of free thinking and free pursuit of pleasure, the queer desire and the deviance from Christian doctrine has doomed them all to hell or whatever eternal fate is left for those who are not lifted from the earth at the end of days when the rapture comes. Here, Meg has employed her most powerful sense, her sense of humor. She has brought back the importance of food as a means of bodily fulfillment and pleasure and security in and of itself for surely there will be no snacks provided at the end of the world for all the deviants left behind. Recalling her use of food as allegorical to different frameworks which function to uphold or subvert normative prescriptions for religious practice, we might suggest that certain metaphorical snacks, like the queer mangoes, which, uh, combat, which combats the rigidity of dogmatic religion and destabilizes systems, can themselves lead to spiritual fulfillment. And with the right snack, and in fact, the abundant feast perpetually cooking in this religious community, there's no concern for leaving the planet. This satisfaction with earthly existence, passing on that heavenly buffet line, alludes to several common Unitarian Universalist beliefs. The belief in universal salvation, that everyone goes to the same place, and the belief in the need to respect the interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part, which often manifests as a sense of climate justice, and like other justice senses, also engenders a call to action to mobilize bodies in the movement to reverse climate change and its ill effects on the people, animals, plants, land, and water. The contentedness to stay behind, to not prioritize or seek an afterlife in a better place is also part of why some Unitarian Universalists are so driven by a progressive activist agenda, which prioritizes a better life for all here on earth. I'll come back to this sense of justice later, again, if there's time, so perhaps not. After we listened to Meg's song, I invited you to call up the feeling of being at home and to consider with what sense we perceive this feeling. Is it a touch, taste, smell, sound, or sight? Certainly memories of home can evoke memories that engage each of these five senses, 
individually and in combination, but is there another sense beyond these in which we might locate the sensation of being at home? Scholarship on the senses suggests there are several senses beyond the five we are taught in kindergarten, though sources vary on what these additional senses may be, and some of this variation can be accounted for by disciplinary, different disciplinary interests. What is agreed upon is that the five sense sensorium is on its own insufficient for encompassing all of human experience. Some scholars seek to illuminate the hierarchy of senses at different periods in history, tracing the changes made uh, and the powers which benefited from them. Other scholars have illuminated the effects of sense hierarchies on radical racialization of peoples around the world. Still others have sought to upend the traditional hierarchy of academia, which privileges the visual and at times the auditory senses. There's also scholarship that calls for sensuality in our academic writing and recognizing embodiment within academic approaches to research and writing. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Pal. Uh, I just was seeing the chat. I will, I will wrap up. Um, in this work, I've tried to incorporate a methodology of sensual scholarship while decentering the visual sense and instead attending to other senses that are expressed in this song. It was by no means comprehensive, but it did allow space to consider other senses relevant to the songwriter and her religious community beyond those in the five sense sensorium, the sense of humor, the sense of justice, the haptic sense, and the sense of belonging. I'll end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Frankie. Um, Next, we have Jess Goldstein Kral um, using they, he pronouns. Jess Goldstein Kral is a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of Texas at Austin. The research interests are in race, gender, sexuality, and interpersonal relationships. All right, thank you so much. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Are we all good? Excellent, okay. So the contemporary US is structured by mononormativity or a system that makes it appear natural, normal and inevitable that two people and only two people will fall in love forever. And we can see mononormativity in love songs about someone's one and only in the prestige that accompanies marriage, which is often assumed to be monogamous and in movies about love triangles that come to resolve in dyadic happily ever afters. We also see mononormativity reflected in the scientific literature on intimate relationships. It's estimated that about 5% of relationships in the contemporary US are consensually non-monogamous or are relationships that allow for multiple sexual or romantic ties. And this is roughly the same size as the LGBTQ population. And yet scholarly research on consensual non-monogamies is sparse. In my dissertation, I interview polyamorous women about their relationship dynamics, both to contribute to scholarship that seeks to understand modern relationships as they really are, um, and also to understand something about the relationship between mononormativity and other systems of inequality. Um, so I rely on two theoretical frameworks that I use broadly to, to approach my dissertation. The first is intersectionality, a framework for understanding systems of oppression as not separate but interlocking. And I use this lens to consider polyamorous relationships within a context of inequality. Mononormativity is not a system that could ever be made sense of as standing alone to shape polyamorous women's lives. Rather, it intertwines with white supremacy, heteronormativity, and patriarchy in the contemporary US, resulting in the privileging of relationships that are between white, heterosexual, and cisgender people. Kim Talbert cultivated what she refers to as a lens of critical polyamory, where she locates mononormativity within settler colonialism. She describes the ways that many indigenous cultures do not privilege a dyadic relationship, but rather envision people as constantly in relation to anyone who they interact with, as well as the environment. And through this lens, there's not a focus on a singular romantic tie, but all interactions that we have with the life around us. 
And we can see through works such as Talvera's the ways in which mononormativity is not natural, normal, or inevitable, and that it's inextricably tied to systems of white supremacy, heteronormativity, and patriarchy that accompany settler colonialism. A lens of intersectionality further allows for understandings of people who are in polyamorous relationships as both contesting systems of inequality, while also being located within them. Um, and I also take a life course approach, which basically suggests two things. It says one, that to understand people, you need to understand their historical context. And the second premise is that we're all shaped by the experiences that happened to us earlier in life. For sexuality scholars who are studying adults, a life course approach often entails understanding people's experiences in adolescence and adulthood, which in turn shape their experiences today. I constructed a dissertation that aimed to understand polyamorous women's relationship dynamics. And originally I was particularly interested in questions of distribution of housework, emotion work, and care work with the hopes that this might tell me something about systems of race, gender, and class inequality. However, I stumbled upon a different and interesting research question that I'm going to dive into today in this presentation. It's a question about women's journeys to polyamory and to queerness and how these two systems are interwoven and linked to white heterosexist patriarchy, often in surprising and counterintuitive ways. And it's also a question that I'm in the midst of puzzling through. So thanks for being with me on this journey um, that is a work in progress. Um, let's see. So I conducted 20 semi-structured interviews with polyamorous women, and participants also completed a baseline survey with demographic information. And the survey allowed for me to code for themes along race, gender, and class without needing to ask participants directly to mention race, gender, or class, which in a society in which white people often pretend to be race blind, and in which it's broadly considered to be impolite to talk about money, this was a useful way to reliably get this information without relying on respondents being the one to bring it up. Interviews were conducted remotely in spring of 2020, and the women in my sample ranged from 22 to 48 years old, with an average of uh, 32. A slight majority of the sample were women of color, with four women identifying as Asian, three as Black, four as Hispanic or Latina, and nine as white. All except for two identified as bisexual or queer. So a large portion of my sample described polyamory as tied to sexual identity exploration. And many women that I talked to described entering into a monogamous relationship with a man when they were an adolescent or early adult and staying in that relationship for a long time. So later in life, when they came out to themselves as bisexual or came to see their bisexuality as an important piece of themselves, these women then faced a choice of to end their long-term relationships with the person who they were with or to transition their relationship to polyamory. And we can see this in the case of Carla, who met her current husband at the age of 21. And in talking about her decision to ask her husband to be polyamorous, she said, part of the reason that kind of clued me in that I wanted to be poly was like, as a bisexual, I felt like I was missing out on half of me. Like I wanted that experience of having a woman partner too. And for Carla, she was faced with the choice of opening up her current relationship, ending her relationship, or missing out on what she felt was half of her. And so she chose polyamory in order to both maintain the relationship with her husband and explore her sexual identity. And Samantha had a similar story. She says, I had always known since as long as I could remember that I was bisexual, but I had gotten into this monogamous relationship since like when I was 17. So it like, I just never got to explore that very much. And so I started to feel, I don't know, maybe a midlife crisis. I felt like I was missing out on myself. And so I proposed to my husband that I would like to try this out. 
And something that I want to point out for both Samantha and Carla is that this choice is particularly important in the context in which sexuality isn't understood as simply who you have sex with, but also in identity. And you can see this in the way that both of them phrased having a relationship with a woman as exploring a part of themselves. Um, one way to make sense of this common narrative would be that in a society in which there exists substantial pressure to be heterosexual and with the understanding that many people don't come to recognize their queerness until later in life, entering into a long-term relationship at a young age means for many people committing to heterosexuality or in short, monogamy, monogamy facilitates heteronormativity. Of course, on the other side of the coin, we can see how in some ways heteronormativity might actually facilitate queerness here. And this is to say that these women didn't express wanting to be polyamorous because they wanted to be in multiple relationships at once. Um, instead, it was like more of a byproduct that they wanted to explore bisexuality and remain with their current partner who was a different gender from them. And um, from, uh, from these narratives, then it's possible to think that Carla, Samantha, and others with similar stories might have gone on to live monogamous lives if it weren't for the pressures of heteronormativity in their youth. Or, in short, heteronormativity facilitates queerness. And this to me is counterintuitive. Um, and it connects to another finding that I have that's somewhat counterintuitive and that I wanted to share. Um, it's patriarchy facilitates bisexuality, question mark. Um, so I've talked about women who engaged in polyamorous relationships really as a byproduct of wanting to explore their queer sexuality and stay with their long-term different gender partner. And there were also women who wanted to be in a polyamorous relationship and whose husband or guy partner were only open to this if she dates a woman. Um, for these women, Patriarchy softened the threat of queer polyamory. And men, because they saw women partners as less than or as sexual objects, were able to reframe polyamory as something that was for them or non threatening. And we can see this in Sarah's story. Sarah is a 42 year old Hispanic and bisexual woman. And at the time, she was in a relationship with an older white man. When Sarah told her partner that she wanted to be polyamorous, he was okay with it in one condition, that she only date other women. Um, she says, I feel like the relationship with the one penis policy did kind of nurture my queerness. Like he was super supportive of me being with other women. Now, what he thought at the time was that if I had a girlfriend, then that gave him access to her. And that was not true. Most of my girlfriends didn't want anything to do with them. And so there's a lot to unpack here. There's a conflation of sex with gender uh, rooted in white cis patriarchy. And there's also an implicit assumption that Sarah's boyfriend had, um, which is that men are entitled to be a part of queer relationships between women. And in particular, that he as a white man was entitled to queer relationships involving women of color. So here we see two contradictory things. We see white and masculinist entitlement to women's bodies and sexualities. And we also see women, women of color, turning this entitlement into a ground for exploring queer sexuality. And we see a similar story with Alexis, um, who's a 35 year old black bisexual woman and who is in a relationship with a younger white man. She says, when I told him I wanted polyamory, he made a threesome innuendo. I was like, okay, I'll let this slide for now, but we're still going to revisit this. And Alexis did not ever describe having threesomes with her partner, did have relationships with other women. And so we see how racialized and gender beliefs about access to queer women, and especially queer women of color, can paradoxically lend themselves to a queer love, hence the statement, patriarchy facilitates bisexuality, question mark. Um, okay, and I, 
I don't quite feel good about ending it there. So I, I chose this example, it's quick. Um, there are many cases of women feeling as if their relationship with other women are less valued in, compar in comparison to their relationships with men. Um, as we can see in this quote, Emma, Emma who's um, in a thruple, says there was this big difficult discussion that we had where I was seeing a pattern where Julia would side with him, our boyfriend, more. One of the things we had a big discussion about was that she doesn't see me as a primary partner, but she sees him as primary. And this is one of many women who I talked to who are questioning if their relationship with other women were seen as treated as less than. So at the same time as we see these white supremacist heteronormative and mononormative logics paradoxically facilitating queerness, it also led to partners experiencing the relationship as unequal. And the same blade that cuts so that men, especially white men, do not feel threatened by their girlfriend or wife's queer relationship creates feelings of unevenness. Um, in short, I find that mononormativity is inextricably interlinked with other systems of inequality and that the women who I spoke to were able to resist these systems in ways that spark her love. That's it. Thank you so much, Jess. That was really amazing. Um, next, we have Caitlin A.B. Pasafiume um, using she, her pronouns. Caitlin is a fifth year PhD candidate in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, where she teaches both Portuguese and Spanish to undergraduate students. Her research attends to queerness and aesthetics as they are as they were manipulated in Latin American colonial times, and she conversely demonstrates how contemporary performance insists on queer visibility as a means of contestation. Thank you very much. And in my presentation today, entitled "Sexual Mongrels and Defiant Desire." I just want to put forth a disclaimer, trigger warning, as it were, to everyone that does include some uh, discussion of violence against queer bodies. Uh, and so I just want to make sure that everyone um, uh, is aware of that going in so that if that is something that you will, you know, not like to hear that you can, um, you know, I won't be offended if you feel you need to uh, excuse yourself here. All right. Let me just quickly get my slideshow going. Right. Amber's shrine sits just paces away from Santiago Chile's Plaza Italia, the center of the ongoing, or not ongoing, excuse me, <laughs> of the 2019-2020 human rights protests in the oh, heart of the capital city. Yes. I'm sorry, I think we can only see one section of your screen. If you're trying to share oh, your full screen. Okay. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. letting me know about that. Uh oh, sorry everyone. Presenting via Zoom can be a little bit of a challenge sometimes. Let's try that one more time. Go back. Hmm. Is that better? Yes, I think so. Okay, great. Um, so I was just speaking about this shrine here to Amber. Um, this makeshift shrine is weathered from the elements, yet it's more intact than the archival story of Amber's life. The shrine is a rare document which persists to tell the story of her death. Strangers and lovers bring small gifts to adorn a memorial, gifts that many imagine she might love. Well wishes, candles, stuffed animals, tubes of lipstick, and the occasional cigarette or glass of whiskey. The shrine site is reminiscent of those constructed in many homes to honor religious saints. Amber is a disidentified saint of the trans world of Santiago. Her memorial marks the spot where she was beaten to death in the street. Official and cultural archives have kept her murder carefully buried, obscuring even the date on which she was murdered. Just a few streets away, a small nondescript uh, 
um, concrete post stands just waist high and bears two words, Monica Briones. Like Amber Shrine, this post marks the spot where the openly lesbian Monica's skull was crushed in the street on July 9th, 1984, during the military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. In my longer study, I tell of how these women were pursued by militant conservatives, how they feared for their loved ones' lives due to their out status, how Monica believed she was being followed in the months leading up to her murder, and how her attacker screamed, Así te quería pillar lesbiana, while committing the act. And I'll just translate that quickly. It basically translates to, this is how I would get you, or this is how I was going to get you, lesbian. For limitations of time, it must suffice to present these public killings as temporal reminders for how LGBTQIA plus phobias are bred through policies of state. Social denial of difference breeds violence, makes a spectacle of death, and then relegates the bodies to archival burial. Foucault calls this public persecution a, quote, policy of terror to make everyone aware through the body of the so-called criminal of the unrestrained presence of the sovereign, end quote. And this was my own emphasis here. These public murders reek of corporal punishment inflicted to castigate queer desire for daring to practice our identities in public. If a society must harbor non-binary desire, it must be done in the private sector alone, the archive seems to say. Diana Taylor advances Foucault's definition of the policy of terror, saying that these policies turn public spectacles and tend to, quote, atomize or paralyze, end quote, the populations. This politics, rooted in fear, forces queer factions underground, thus denying existences. As Foucault outlines, sexuality is essentially political, and following Hannah Arendt and On Violence, we understand how death is the ultimate anti-political act rendering bodies non-political. Although Amber, Monica, and countless other histories are nearly invisible in the archive, contemporary performers use their own bodies to subvert dynamics of state terror, contesting their disposability and asserting their right to desire. Jose Esteban Munoz calls these disidentificatory acts. Here, I argue that performatic acts by artist Hija de Perra and horror drag interventions by the group known as Kiltra serve as such disidentificatory practices, subverting Chile's ongoing gender terror into an aesthetic of queer desire. Through this transformation, these groups archive the violence towards LGBTQIA plus persons in Chile while reclaiming political and social subjectivity. Um, I just wanna quickly make a, a parallel here between um, the late, not late president, the president whose term just ended on March 11th of this year, Sebastian Piñeda. A lot of the protesters, especially uh, lesbian women and people um, of um, other, you know, gender statuses, these weren't reflected in the archive again. Um, however, there was a lot of militarized violence directed towards these bodies during that period of time. Um, and so I just want to point that out that it is, um, you know, a reproduced trope in Chilean society under a president who mirrored a lot of tactics. So under that we come to understand that citizenship is not automatic, rather it is a reward for subscribing to colonizing values of desire, leading to procreation and to ultimately recreating the, that model nation, um, the, that paradigm would like to see. As such, my research contributes to the development of decolonizing theory while advancing the discussion of performance techniques and their unique power to enact and imagine futures. Finally, I promote Diana Taylor's theory of the performatic space, uh, which contests the institutional stage space referred to as performative in this longer study, uh, because the performative, as she said, quote, props up occidental logocentrism, end quote. Um, referring to this decolonized anti-stage space as performatic instead, Taylor reminds her readers of historical persecution and colonization carried out 
through staged theatricality on many um, original people's bodies, especially uh, the uh, example that I quote in my dissertation is that of the Selknam people who used theatricality. Uh, what we, of course, define from a Western perspective as the theatrics, that's really important to make that distinction. Um, but in order to exp explain their own origin stories, uh, and then uh, that was then, you know, turned on its head to to then subjugate uh, large groups of people. And so for her, it's really important that we depart from that notion of this Western stage space uh, in order to actually contest those things laid down during colonial times. Um, but in contrast, Munoz argues that performances like those seen here, oh, so this is um, here, the slide where I sort of um, show uh, some of that ongoing violence towards uh, towards these here, I believe are all for uh, identifying as women. Uh, <clears throat> Munoz argues that performances like those seen here possess a world making power and quote, offer the minor minoritarian subject a space to situate itself in history and thus uh, seize social agency, end quote. In its complete form, this study begins with the spectral histories of Amber and Monica, two case studies of gender violence that stand in for all those archival invisibilities. The death of these non-binary women help us understand the larger processes of social denial, disposability, and archival refusal. I further argue that this identificatory performance acts have the power to repurpose the body whose genitals have been locked in a binary cage an idea posited by Paul Beatriz Preciado in Testo Yankee. Synthesizing queer and performance theories, I conjure Zab Tortorici's notion of queer archival archivalism as a methodology. By exploring the fraught relations of neoliberal Chile in this way, I contest the violent silent archive with decomposing stories of those gone, but not forgotten, all but forgotten. I will demonstrate the disidentificatory power of contemporary artistic movements begotten from these archival violences. So I'll move forward with the analysis of Hija de Perra in, um, in the film Empana de Pino. Uh, and as I, I do say that I will refer to multiple um, performances, I'll probably just skim over the very last one in the interest of time and to, to give it some visibility. Uh, but Hija de Perra is arguably the most pronounced Chilean example of a performer who employs their body as a direct challenge to societal and political gender control. Although the transformista trans queen died in Santiago in 2014, her archival presence negates the death which rendered her desires essentially unpolitical. Her embodied politics are mortal, I argue, for in, a, in writing her body into the archive in an indelible fashion, she uses her instrument uh, of performance beyond death to contest violences which hide bodies like those of Briones and Amber. The artist's overtly sexual and political performances condemn everything that conservative Chilean values reward. In Empana de Pino, uh, which was um, released in 2008. It stars Ija de Perra and was directed by Chilean filmmaker known as Wincy, um, named Edwin Oyarsi. A direct conviction of conservative binary structures as the culprit of gender horror, its opening credits pronounce its genre as, quote, terrorismo visual, which means visual terrorism, end quote. The film is decidedly low budget and grotesquely raw. It chronicles the gallivanting daily activities of two women, the trans woman Ija de Perra who plays herself and the unnamed actress who plays the supporting role of Perdida. The first five minutes are a domestic instructional video on making the most typical Chilean empanada. Here we have food uh, metaphors as a theme today. The clip's protagonist, so I wanted to just um, show, I believe I accidentally deleted the clip, but we don't really have time for a clip anyway, so I'll just explain it to everyone. Um, <clears throat> this clip's protagonist wears short curls molded to her head, 
as you may imagine a traditional housewife to do. She pronounces the ingredients of this empanada. Masa madre, which is a typical Chilean dough, olives, eggs, flour, lard, and carne molida, or ground beef. The video, a how-to on producing a culinary treat that is representative of Chilenidad, or Chileneity, what it means to be Chilean, thematically informs the viewer of empanada's reason for being. A role reversal in every sense of the term, Chile Chilenidad, Chileneity, is the product and traditional values are the ingredients. The horror film reveals the main ingredients of the empanada. The carne molida is ground from human flesh. And the would-be victims are no longer those bodies which threaten the conservative binary, but rather those that embody it. In this inverted social structure, queer is master. The plot continues in a staccato fashion as it jumps between moments depicting a queer party that ends with the public harassment of a heterosexual man whose crime is shouting malo malo at the group of partiers or essentially condemning them and the party that they're having. The film oscillates between hilarity and horror and intermittently produces scenes of the post-porn genre where one was meant to kill but instead finds themselves in the sex act. This seems to suggest that there is a feeling behind all of that hatred of the sexual other. Is there a secret desire lurking behind that phobic violence? Hija de Perra pronounces this, pronounces this playfulness mixed with gore as, quote, jugar para olvidar, jugar y olvidar, or basically, or end quote, translating to playing to forget, to play and forget. Here we see the forces of disidentification at work once more. While these practices serve many purposes as pronounced by Munoz, the idea of playing to forget suggests this humor as a trauma response from violent oppression. Thematically, Empanada Pino introduces that which is considered to be typically Chilean in order to critique and invert ideologies. With binary gender and sexuality at the heart of the critique, soccer, religion, conservative dress, and aesthetics, and certainly cuisine are positioned as these components which, when combined into one cultural mixture, render a dangerous product whose recipe begets violence. Cuisine, though, is at the axis of this critique, presenting violence against fellow humans as Chilean tradition in empana form. As cannibalization of your own kind, of one perceived by society to be less than human. The production reclaims the aesthetic of horror, inverting the terror that has been inflicted upon individuals playing divergent, displaying divergent desires. And instead of going through my piece on Kiltra, I will just show you a few images here of Kiltra's sort of um, performatic interventions. I got the opportunity to attend a few of these interventions, uh, an experience I'll always cherish. Um, but I just sort of wanted to drive home the point by showing these images, the point that um, through these, um, through these, uh, you know, specifically Chilean acts, it, combined with the history of violence against LGBTQIA plus folks, uh, we can really see this aesthetic merging as a way of liberating desire and sort of turning that terror on its head. So in conclusion, this study synthesizes distinct theoretical approaches to understand ways in which contemporary performance acts possess the ability to rupture bio biopolitical control of bodies which contest state binary values. By combining decolonizing theory with performance studies, I approach archival silences with embodied performances as a way to fill those silences. I assert that dis disidentificatory practices possess a transformative power, like that seen in the horror aesthetic adopted by Hija de Perra and Quiltra in contemporary Chile. This repurposing of a state politics of terror reclaims a social and political agency imploring us to write in lost histories of violence. We pay homage to those like Ambar Briones and Briones requesting that their stories of defiant desire become official history so that education may impede the rampant trans and homophobia 
transphobia and homophobia that sealed their brutal fates. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, that was really amazing. This panel was incredible. I was so excited after reading your abstracts and I'm not disappointed at all. Of course, I knew I wasn't going to be. Um, unfortunately, um, we are a bit over time and I wanna give the next panel ample time to, you know, get up, use the bathroom, do all of body need things. Um, and so we will, move um, past the Q&A, take a quick breather, come back at 5.30 and um, yeah, end our first day of the conference. Thank you all so, so, so much for being here.